I'd just like to welcome you to uh, uh, a very unusual and remarkable series of, of talks and lessons. I'm glad that you enjoy our lessons. They go worldwide uh, in many countries of the world, and they go all over the United States of America. And these lessons, we're teaching you how to live. We're giving you seven steps, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, today's lesson has seven steps up out of a crisis. Uh, many of us find ourselves in a deep, deep crisis, you know, and, and sometimes we say, how, how, how do you get out, you know? And so today's lesson has to do with that. And there are steps in life. I mean, we, we, we must come to that truth that there are steps in life, and these steps uh, you must uh, assume, and you must take, and you must use. You cannot sit in a problem and, and drown yourself there. Uh, if there is a problem, then you must have the courage and the strength to rise up out of that problem and say, hey, I'm, I'm having no relationship with that thing. I'm coming up out of it. And if you will do that, there are steps to victory. Now, I'm sure that there are steps to victory, and we want you to be involved in those steps. If you would like to follow me today, I would be very delighted for that. And so we would like for you to, to say, I would like to understand how to take seven steps out of a crisis. We will do this through the person of Moses. Now, that's what the great figures of history are for there to study. That's what Jesus came to the earth for, for you to study how a person can live on the face of this earth. And Moses, he was the commander in chief of the largest exodus of human persons in the history of military maneuvers. You got it? Moses was the commander in chief, the final voice and authority of the largest exodus of human persons in the history of mankind. These persons had been slaves for 10 generations. Twice the age of America. Yeah, twice the age of America for 10 generations. With two to three million slaves who are in bondage in Egypt, Moses had a crisis. And I'm going to name those and tell you how he came up out of that crisis victorious until more than 3,000 years later. You must praise the man for how he came up out of that crisis. So you must follow the steps, you know, minutely and carefully, or you won't know how he got out of his crisis, but you will get out of your crisis the same way. <laughs> yeah, this is the way out of a crisis, and this is seven steps to get out. You see, he was in Egypt. He had an impossible situation. He had a Red Sea in front of him. And, and, and the waters of that Red Sea were a menace. They were death in the natural. Behind him, he had a, a juggernaut. It was the Egyptian elect warriors. They were the finest and the best. They were the ones that rode in the chariots and fought in midair. They could sling those, those spears and they could weave those swords right over the horse's head. They were the chariot warriors of Egypt. They were the proud, proud group. Now, besides the Red Sea in front of him and the mighty militant warriors behind him, he then had the mountain fastness on both sides of him until in verse 3 here of Exodus 14, uh, the king of Egypt, King Pharaoh, said, they are entangled in the land. You see, he was a military strategist. He said, they are entangled in the land. All right. You see, how in the world did he get out? Uh, now, you won't want to believe the first one, but it's a, it, maybe it's the greatest one. The first one we will find in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. Moses said to the people, fear ye not. Fear ye not. Stand still. Some of you run around too much. See the salvation of the Lord. Look for the Lord's salvation. He will show you today, today, today. The Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. <laughs> Neighbors, fear is a destroyer. Before God could do anything, he could not open up the sea and he could not split the mountain. 
He could not do anything until fear got out of their hearts. So the first step out of tragedy, the first step out of crises is fear thou not. If you're going to shake and tremble with fear, you're not going to get out of much of anything. You must get fear out of your total being. Now mark these down because they're great steps. The number one step was fear not. And how do you know it's gone? He said, stand still. <laughs> Nervous people can't stand still. Fearful people can't stand still. Fear you not. Stand still before God. You don't have to run this way and that way. Get your equilibrium. Stand still. Then he said, observe the salvation of the Lord. Let, let your salvation, let your inner, inner being know that your outer being should look to God, you see, should look to God. And he prophesied. He said, that bunch of enemies back there that you see, you will never see them again. And, and so they, the first thing was to get fear out of their hearts. All right, number two, the second step. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 14, he says, Jehovah shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Those are some of the greatest words you could ever imagine being uttered by a human being. He was in a mess saying this. Brother, he was entangled saying this. I, I mean, he wasn't saying this on a bright and shiny day. No, he had those people with a Red Sea in front. He had those people with an army behind them. He had those people with high mountains on each side of them and no, no way to get through those hills. They were finished. Uh, the king said they are entangled in the land. Verse 15 says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore crowst thou unto me? Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. <laughs> not backward and not stand there any longer. Go forward. Not behind to the Egyptians, uh, not to the turbulent waters of the Red Sea, but just go forward, he said. And so the, the, the second step out of a crisis is to look the right direction. You know, we sometimes look at the gloomiest part. We sometimes look at the most devastating part. Uh, we, 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 we look at the wrong place and we see the wrong thing. <laughs> we don't see the right thing. And so first he said, fear not, get fear out of you. And then when you get fear out of you, look the right direction. If you look toward victory and if you look toward anointing and if you look toward prosperity, some of us, our heads are down. We're looking into the mud. That is not the place to look. The place to look is out yonder, out there. He said, look unto me and live. <laughs> you know, look unto me and live. He said, he, he said, uh, look, the Lord shall fight for you. Hold your peace. Stop your talking down there. Hold your peace. And then he said, go forward, you see. And so they were looking to a higher source of strength, a higher source of power, a higher source of anointing. They were not looking under themselves. They could not look under themselves. They couldn't match Pharaoh's army. They were not qualified to fight. They had been slaves for 10 generations. They, they, were, they were not qualified to fight. The, the, the waters of the Red Sea were laving the shore with waves. Hey, they said, hey, you can't make it there either. The mountains, well, their peaks were so high, the children can't go. One or two of the strong men might run over the mountain, but the children, the animals, uh, the wives, they, they, they cannot go. And, and so God says, then look to me. <laughs> look to me, look to me. When, when all four areas are blocked, then look, to, look up. When you can't look out, look up. And so he said, look unto me. And so the second step uh, out of their crisis was when God said, look up unto me. The third, the third step to their victory was, is very significant. God spoke to them and said, hear the right voice. Hear the right voice. Now you better believe me, there were women crying, there were children crying, there were old men sad, and we ought to be back in Egypt. We ought to be back in Egypt. We ought to be back make, making bricks. And they had to decide what voice they were going to hear. Now, now, neighbors, if you're going to come up out of your crisis, you will not be able to listen to your mother-in-law and your father-in-law 
and the man next door, <laughs> you're going to have to hear the right voice. You can't come up out of your crises listening to contention and, and listening to strife and, and listening to, you got to close your ears. Almost everything I've ever done, I had to close my ears to everybody except God. When God told me to be a missionary when I was 20 years old, there was not one human being that encouraged me to do it. My father said, you have no money to go overseas and you don't know anything about it. You've never been there. We likely won't ever see you again. My mother buried her head in a bath of tears that her son was going away only 20 years of age. When I left San Francisco, I only had $12 in the world. The man that took me to the boat to get on the boat and to sail out through that San Francisco Harbor. The man that took me to the boat was a man three times my age. And, and Dr. Craig had a large Bible college. He owned a radio station in the city of San Francisco. He had one of the largest churches in the nation at that time, seating over 3,000 people. He said, son, you will go to China and starve to death. Huh. I had to decide what voice to listen to. I had to decide what voice to listen to. And if I couldn't determine the right voice to listen to, I'd have died right there. I'd have never gotten any further than right there. But I, I had to listen to the voice, the voice of God that 18 months before has said, see this whole world, I'm holding you responsible for bringing people to heaven and telling them about me. And that was the voice I followed. And because of that voice, I got on that boat and I started off around the world and God supplied my needs in Australia, in Indonesia, in, in, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Indochina, or Vietnam, in Southwest China, in, in Tibet, in, Man, in Manchuria, in Mongolia, in Korea, in Japan, in Siberia, and in Russia, and in Poland, and in Scandinavia, in Norway, in Sweden, and Denmark, uh, in, in Germany, in France, <laughs> in England. Yeah, yeah, he did. I didn't get any money from America. God supplied my needs all the way, right on the spot. Why? I heard the right voice. I heard the right voice. I cannot, I cannot bring to your attention how necessary it is for you to listen to the right voice. If you're going to listen to a negative voice, and if you're going to listen to a fearful voice, you're going to die where you are. Uh, these people had to hear from heaven and hear the right voice and not hear. Th those Egyptians back there were saying, we're victorious, we're, we're victorious, we're going to kill you. It doesn't matter what the enemy says about you. That don't make it real. Your enemies can say, you're going to fall down. You're not going to make it. That don't have anything to do with it. What has to do with it is what God says and what you believe. And if you believe right and God speaks right, you got it made. You got it made. And so they came up out of their dilemma, out of their crises, because, because they heard the right voice. Now, Let's, 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 let's have a look at them here. First, they refused to fear. And they, they said, no, we won't fear. And number two, they put their eyes in the correct direction. Not toward their difficulties, not toward their high mountains, not by their roaring sea. Not, not, not those Egyptians with the clatter of the horses and the grinding of the wheels coming after them. No, no, they said, we're going to look up and not out. Some of you need to look up. You're looking out and it's, and it's dismal and dark. And then number three, they had to hear the right voice. And number four, in Ephesians chapter six and verse 13, it says, therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about, about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, having done all to stand, stand therefore. And so the fourth step that they had to take up was to stand still before God. It's easy to get nervous. It's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get confused. And at that moment, you just halt and hold everything steady. I want to tell you, I do that very often. I just back off away from people. I back off away from people into a quiet place. And I just say, hey, Lord, <laughs> You're the wise one, and you're the good one. You're the all-sufficient one. Now, now what shall I do? What shall I do? Other people might think I'm moving fast, but I'm not. I'm moving slow. 
for the simple reason that I wait until God says, do it. And that's when I do it, when God says, do it. So the point number four, up out of your crisis is not to get nervous and run scatterbrain, not to try to run all four directions at the same time, but before God, just hold everything. Having done all to stand, just stand right there. You stand in faith, you, you stand in courage, you stand in love, you stand. You don't fall down, you stand. And as you stand, you're waiting for directions. And brother, when God gives them, they work. And you better believe it. When God gives them, they work. He says, you're waiting for direction. So now we see what we do. We, we just stand still before God. That, and and I, I want to tell you something. It's real, it's real difficult to get most people to stand still. It's real hard. There are people that, <laughs> brother, they're like a wild goose. You, you can't get them to stand still. There are people running around from church to church. They don't even know where to go to church. They run to this church one Sunday, to another church the next Sunday, to another church the next Sunday. You know, they haven't stood still to see what God has determined for their lives. In the quietness, God can speak to you and direct you. And so the people, and it's hard to get that bunch, the cows had to stand still, the horses had to stand still, the babies had to stand still, the whole bunch stood before God and, and got themselves quiet and, and got themselves together, you know, for marching, for hearing God. Until you get yourself still, you have a roaring going on, you know, and you're not, you don't know exactly what to do because of all the roaring. But when you stand still before the Lord, you're getting information. You're getting direction. You're getting what God wants you to have, you see? And so he says, just stand still for a few moments here. And so the, the direction that they had, the direction they had in point number four was to get all the people to, to stand before the Lord. You know, some people in such a hurry, they can't get God's will. They're always rushing to nowhere. Most people, if you ask them what they did next, last week, they wouldn't know. They've rushed so many times since then, they have no idea what they were doing. You know, stand still before the Lord. Let God give you directions. And you won't have any wasted time. You know, when God directs you, you don't have wasted time. You know, two thirds of the things we do, we do over again. We didn't stand still to get the directions properly. You don't have to do things over when you do them after you stand still in Jesus' name. All right, number five. What was the fifth thing? The step, fifth step up out of this crisis. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 31, it says that Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and they also believed his servant Moses. Now, what was the, the great thing that these people did? They observed and they saw God's salvation. When Moses told those people to march forward. Brother, God opened up those waters and they went right through the great Red Sea. They went right straight through the whole thing to the other side. And when they got through to the other side, they saw God's salvation. They witnessed God's salvation. They knew, it says, all Israel saw the great work which Jehovah had done upon the Egyptians and upon them too. He'd opened up the Red Sea, but they that did not believe and they that, that were not covered by the blood on the lintels and the doorpost rushed in for the blessing and it wasn't there for them. You can't rush into God's thing and think you're gonna get God's blessings when you don't serve God, when your life is not covered with the blood of Jesus. No, 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 you're, you're, you're running in, you're running in uh, into a place where you should tremble because the judgment of God will be there. These Egyptians found out they were not ready for that miracle. They were not ready for it. They didn't have the blood on the doorpost. They had hatred and, and killing in their hearts. They were not under the blood covenant. And it says all the people that they feared the Lord. That means they, they, they respected God and they appreciated God. And it says, and they believed in Jehovah and they also believed in his servant Moses. They saw, they saw and witnessed God's salvation. That was, that was number five. And then number six, number six, and their steps up out of their dilemma. Num, num, number, number six that they had was in verse 14, chapter 14 and verse 30. It says, and thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore and they did not themselves kill one of them. They permitted 
God to fight for them. They permitted God to fight for them. Now that is not easy, you know. We would much prefer doing our own fighting. We would much prefer <laughs> going into the battle ourselves. It's so much easier when you say, I'm going to win this one. No, it's so much greater when God does it, when God does it. We, we know that in God, that there are victories that we cannot win in ourselves. There are those who are more than conquerors. How can you be more than a conqueror? A conqueror is when two great powers come head to head, you know, bang, and, and, and one of them wins. Then he is the conqueror. But to be more than a conqueror, you don't do anything. You just stand up and God knocks your enemies down and God wins the battle, well, that's more than being a conqueror. You didn't fight. You just let God do your fighting. In Moses' day, uh, he, he, married, he married a black woman. Uh, uh, he married a woman from Ethiopia, and, and uh, his sister was angry about it. She says, why did you do that for? Why did you do that? You had no business doing that. Yank, 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 you know? And you know, if a man will fight you about anything, he'll fight you about his wife. He don't consider that anybody's business in the world. And you know what Moses did? Nothing. And, and when Moses kept quiet, and, and the Bible designated him then uh, as, as a person in all the world with the greatest meekness. Here he was the leader of a nation, and he was a meek man. You don't find it very often. And, and, and mighty men, you seldom find meekness. That here was a, a meek man. And, and so uh, uh, Moses never said a word. And God got so upset because of Miriam fussing at her brother, you see, until, until God brought the judgment of leprosy upon her. And she had to be put outside the camp because of her leprosy. And Moses had to go and pray for her before she could get healed. <laughs> what a humiliation. What a humiliation. It is so easy, you know, to fight your own battles. It is so difficult just to wait and let God fight our battles. I want to assure you the greatest victories I have ever won, God did it and not me. God did it and not me. God did it. Let him bring you up out of your crisis. Let him bring you up out of your sorrows. Let Jehovah fight your battles for you. He did not, <coughs> not one of their men got their hands dirty. God won the battle for them. He opened up the sea. He brought them through victoriously. <clears throat> he destroyed the enemies behind them. And like Moses prophesied, they would never see them again. And that was the end of them, you see. God fought their battle. All right. Uh, number, num number seven. What, what is the secret of coming up out of a crisis? In Exodus, in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 17, God says, lift up your rod and, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And, and, and Moses lifted up his rod, stretched it out, and the sea divided itself, divided itself, and they walked through on dry ground. This is maybe the greatest of all the steps. You're to use what you have. You're to use what you have. Jesus could never have fed the 4,000 had it not been for a little boy <laughs> who had five loaves and two fishes. You see, he had to use what he had. He had to have a starter. All Moses had was a shepherd's rod. He held that thing up and he started marching with it right out in front of him. Oh, it looks stupid. You better believe it looks stupid. You start marching into the murky waters of a sea with a stick in front of you and see what everybody will do. They'll laugh at you. He used what he had. Now, if he had not used what he had, he would not have gotten the miracle that he got. You have to use what God has given you. God does not bless laziness. God does not bless people that fold their hands and say, I ain't got anything and I can't do anything. God doesn't, doesn't bless you. God doesn't help you. He will not. If you wish to be blessed of the Most High, look and say, now, what do I have? What do I have? You know, you know, you know, some people, because they don't have $10 to give to God, they won't even give him one. They won't even use what they have, you see, what you have. God can multiply it. God can use it. That little rod, what could a stick do? What could a stick do? Well, in the hands of God, it opened up a Red Sea. 
he marched out into those waters. That oh, long white haired man, over 80 years old, began to stride out to those waters. And brother, when, when, when he got down to the sand, he looked in front of him and to his amazement, he saw those waters running, chasing, whoo, away they went, running, hither and thither. And in the Psalms it says, they were congealed, which means frozen. They were frozen up on both sides into the sky. And God very quickly, uh, through his mighty system of heating, dried up the, the bottom of that thing. It says they went through dry shod.